talk of today, we start with the short video on the Laura Bassi life. Please. Start with the short video on the Laura Bassi life, please. Start Laura with the was short born video on 29 on October 1711. Life. In 1732, she earned a degree of doctor in philosophy from the University of Bologna. A few months later, Laura was born her remarkable scientific skills. The Senate of 1730 assigned her a degree of honor. experiments with her husband in her own home, in a special laboratory that the couple had to keep. Okay, today our speaker is uh, Brenda Namumba, is uh, the first Zambian that uh, has uh, obtained a PhD in astrophysics. She obtained this bachelor uh, degree in uh, physics at the University of Zambia, and later she moved to South Africa and where in 2019 she obtained uh, is PhD, the PhD from the University of Cape Town. She is now a fellow of the South African Radio Astronomy Observatory. And today she will talk about uh, dwarf galaxies and their H1 properties. Please, Brenda. Okay, can you get me? Yes, can yes, you get me? Yes, can go. Okay. Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, my name is Brenda Namumba, a postdoc fellow at Rhodes University. Thank you very much for inviting me to give a, a seminar um, as we celebrate an important woman in science. Uh, in this presentation, I will highlight the H1 mapping of dwarf galaxies with SKA Pathfinder telescopes 
Uh, my main focus is to highlight the capabilities of uh, these telescopes when it comes to studying dwarf galaxies. Uh, so the outline of my presentation, I will talk about dwarf galaxies and uh, dwarf galaxies in the local group. I'll also highlight neutral hydrogen observations uh, and some of the results, previous results that have been obtained uh, from H1 observations when it comes to studying dwarf galaxies. I'll talk about uh, the results from the SKA Pathfinder, that's uh, the CAT7 telescopes. And I'll also talk about uh, some of the results that have been obtained from the SKA Precursor telescope, that is MayaCAT. Um, I will talk about my ongoing work. And last but not the least, I'll summarize my presentation. So to begin with, when we talk about dwarf galaxies, uh, just like uh, many, many other galaxies that exist in the universe, uh, dwarf galaxies are just one type of well, those galaxies. Uh, some of the properties of these dwarf galaxies are that they tend to be very smaller in sizes. I've given an example when you look at the figure on my left, uh, there is a Milky Way in the middle and uh, we have two dwarf galaxies left and right. When we talk of them being smaller in size, you can just see how small they are compared to our, our own galaxy, that's the Milky Way. They also tend to have low luminosity, low mass, and also low surface brightness. These objects have low surface brightness, meaning that they tend to be very difficult to detect. To detect. You need long integration time for us to be able to detect these objects. And that has been uh, one, of the difficult, um, one of the difficult things when it, uh, things when it comes to studying dwarf galaxies. Mm. So, when we look at dwarf galaxies, there are different types of uh, dwarf galaxies. We have what we call the early type dwarf, ga dwarf galaxies. Uh, they tend to, to have low gas content, little or, or no star formation in them. And uh, an example of these are the dwarf ellipticals. Uh, we also have what we call the dwarf, uh, the late type dwarf galaxies. These are the dwarf irregulars and the blue compact dwarf galaxies. They tend to have high gas content with ongoing star formation. And they are mostly used to study the gas content of galaxies. Uh, on my part, because my focus is mainly on neutral hydrogen, so I look at the late type dwarf galaxies. So from now on, when I talk of late dwarf galaxies, I'm actually referring to the late type dwarf galaxies. Why are these uh, galaxies actually important for us in astrophysics? When we look at uh, late type dwarf galaxies, they have low level of evolution in that they have high gas content, uh, low metallicity, meaning that they are, their properties are similar to what we expect to exist in the earlier universe. So for us, understanding these objects can actually help us to have an idea of what actually happened in the earlier universe. Uh, the other thing is that um, these dwarf galaxies tend to have a very simple structure. Unlike spiral, uh, spiral galaxies that have spiral arm bulges, these, these galaxies tend to have a simple structures and the physics of understanding these objects is much, much more simpler as compared to galaxies such as uh, spiral galaxies. Uh, so when we want to study dwarf galaxies, uh, there are different environments when we look at uh, the universe and uh, trying to understand the uh, uh, galaxies. We have uh, groups, we have clusters, so on and so forth. But when we look at the local group, so the local group is where our own galaxy reside in, studies have been able to show that in this group, majority of the galaxies are actually dwarf galaxies. So all the galaxies that you are seeing in greenish are, are dwarf galaxies, and we have three spiral, spiral galaxies in this group. So the local group becomes an ideal lab uh, for us to be able to study dwarf galaxies because they are abundant objects in this group. And in addition to that, because our own galaxy, the Milky Way, resides in the local group, objects in this group are actually very close to us. So the proximity allows us to study this group, at this, this object at much, much more detailed as compared to galaxies that, exist, that are very, very far from, from the Milky Way. 
Uh, I said earlier on that uh, my focus is, uh, they are different. We can study galaxies at different wavelengths, but my focus is neutral hydrogen. And uh, there are reasons why neutral hydrogen is very important in astrophysics. Uh, so this is uh, just uh, a brief description of how this line is uh, actually comes about. So when you have an, a, a hydrogen atom, it has a, a neutron and an electron. Uh, their spins can e either exist parallel to each other or anti-parallel. Uh, the state from it being parallel to anti-parallel to each other actually produces uh, an emission of 21 centimeter proton. And that's how we actually have this 21 centimeter line. So why is neutral hydrogen important in astrophysics? It's important because one, it's actually the most dominant element in the interstellar media. It's the most abundant element in the universe actually. And uh, observations have been able to show that neutral hydrogen tends to be much more extended as compared to other, uh, other wavelengths. For instance, if we are looking at the galaxy in optical and in neutral hydrogen, we find that neutral hydrogen tends to be much more extended and it gives us a great overview of the morphology, uh, structure and other parameters of what we want to understand about galaxies. Last but not the least is uh, it's a reservoir for star formation. We know that the star forms when there's molecular hydrogen, but for, molecule, for the molecules to form, we first have to have the atoms. So neutral hydrogen is actually very essential when uh, it comes to understanding star formation. And therefore it's important that we understand the properties of galaxies using this uh, element. Uh, so previous studies, before I started doing this work, there are previous studies that have been carried out uh, using neutral hydrogen to study dwarf galaxies. And I'll just highlight a few, what can we learn uh, when we use this 21 centimeter line. Uh, the first thing is that uh, studies have been able to show that uh, when you're studying dwarf irregular galaxies, these are the late types, the H1 tends to be much more extended than the optical disk. In certain, in certain cases, such as NGC 3741, the H1 diameter is eight times more than the stellar disk. And that helps us actually to understand the large scale distribution of these galaxies. The other thing is that when we are deriving the kinematics of galaxies, that is the rotation velocity as a function of radius, uh, that's the figure I'm showing on my left bottom, you find that when we use neutral hydrogen, because it's much more extended, we are able to go much further in radii as compared to the optical, the optical, the optical rotation curve. And that helps us to actually be able to estimate uh, close to the total mass of the galaxy as compared to when we are using um, optical observations. I'll highlight more on the importance of the rotation curve in H1 uh, in the slides, coming slides. Uh, last but not the least is we can also understand the environmental effects uh, by using neutral hydrogen to study galaxies. Uh, I've given an example. If you look at my bottom right, we have uh, a group of galaxy that uh, on, on my left, it was observed in optical. And on my right, we use hydrogen observations. We can see that in optical, it shows galaxies that are separated by a distance and nothing is happening between them, like they are individual galaxies. But when we look at them in radio, we find that actually these galaxies are connected to each other. There's a lot happening. We have bridges, we have tails, which shows that there is interaction happening uh, with, around these galaxies. And these properties, we can actually see them more when we use neutral hydrogen as compared to other tracers. So that's why neutral hydrogen is, has become very important in astrophysics when it comes to understanding galaxy formation and evolution. Uh, so for radio astronomers, when we are, or we are actually um, doing our observations, there are different types of telescopes that we can actually use uh, to carry out our observations. We have what we call single dish telescopes. An example is the Green Bank Telescope in the United States. Uh, so these single dish telescopes tend to have very, they are very large in diameter, like for the GBT, it's 100 meter in diameter. The advantage of these single dish telescopes is that it gives us the total H1, the global content. We can actually be able to derive all the global content H1. Content of the, sorry. So we also, what we, we, we also have what we call the
Okay, so we also, sorry, we also have what we call the, the, uh, the interferometers. And for instance, is the VLA in the United States. The advantage of uh, telescopes such as the VLA is that they actually give us the resolution. They have higher angular resolution. Therefore, we can be able to get fine structures that different components entangle different components from, 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 from a galaxy, for instance. And uh, I've just given an example of one galaxy that was observed using the single dish telescope and uh, using an interferometer. Uh, this is the IC10. So it's uh, when you look at the galaxy that I'm showing on my left, uh, it was observed with the Green Bank Telescope. And on my right, it was observed with the VLA. The Green Bank Telescope, IC10 looks like a blob. It's not well resolved, but we are able to actually detect faint extended structures. The sensitivity gives us an opportunity to actually detect faint extended structures. For the VLA, we have different components that are well defined. We have the southern tail that just appears like a blob with the GBT, but we have different components that are well resolved. But because of its resolution, uh, it's, uh, the sensitivity is low, so we are not able to detect like the low extended uh, feature that we see with the GBT. So with the coming of the SKA, uh, this is uh, a big radio telescope that will be built in the in the in the in, in, in the uh, in South Africa and uh, in Australia, we have what we call SKA pathfinders and SKA precursor telescopes. These uh, telescopes are being built with unique capabilities that has, have both sensitivity and resolution. For uh, one example of this telescope is the Meerkat. So the Meerkat is built with uh, a compact configuration, uh, a compact configuration meaning that it has uh, something that it, makes it like a single dish. So the res resolution is poor, but it's sens sensitive to large scale structures. Uh, and it also has telescopes that are being built at larger distances, which actually is able to give us the resolution. Uh, so with these telescopes such as Meerkat, we, we are actually gaining in both sensitivity and resolution. And that's why they've become very vital uh, in studying galaxies uh, re using radio observations. Uh, so for my studies, when I was doing my PhD, uh, South Africa was actually starting to develop the SKA. And the first telescope that they built was the CAT-7. Uh, this was known as the SKA Pathfinder. Uh, this telescope was actually built as an engineering test bed for Meerkat. It was not initially built for science. So it was uh, a seven dish array. Uh, each dish was 12 meter in diameter. Uh, they, the the the, uh, the 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 uniqueness of this uh, instrument is that it was built with compact baselines from uh, 26 to 186 meters which makes it very important to actually study large scale distribution as i said earlier on when we look at dwarf irregular galaxies they tend to have an extended h1 envelope which can actually be detected with the instruments that have compact baselines so scientists thought, well, even if it's an engineering test bed, why can't we try and do science with this instrument? And um, we were able to get very, very interesting results from, uh, from this instrument. My entire PhD was actually focused on, on using observation from this, uh, from this uh, CAT-7 telescope. So when we look at some of the, of some of the results that we obtained from this, galaxy, from this uh, telescope, uh, one of the dwarf irregular galaxies that we observed was uh, NGC 6822. Uh, this object was previously observed with uh, the ATCA radio telescope in Australia. And uh, our motivation was that because CAT-7 has more compact baselines than uh, ATCA, we were looking for more extended H1 structure that Meerkat can detect that ATCA was not able to detect. And for sure, when you look at, uh, for instance, our global profile, that is the flux density as the function of velocity, that's the figure on my top left. Uh, you can see that with CAT7, we are able to actually detect much more flux than what the 
ATCA observations were able to give us. And um, when we look at uh, the H1 column density map uh, on my right, so the H1 contours are the, uh, so the contours are the H1 and the uh, overlaid on an optical image. The interesting thing you get from this CAT7 observation is that although we are actually just detecting large scale structures, the resolution is not that bad. We can actually detect even features that exist, that actually uh, exist on these, uh, some of these galaxies. For instance, on NGC 6822, you have what is distinct here is an H1 hole that you, you can actually see when you use interferometers, but you cannot see this when you actually use single dish telescope. So even if uh, it has compact bus line, but uh, we are able to get the H1 as well as get some of the features that we want to actually be able to detect from these galaxies. Uh, the other thing that I looked at from this uh, CAT7 observations when I looked at NGC 6822 uh, is I, I, I derived the H1 kinematics and uh, the H1 kinematics in astrophysics are very important because the expected rotation velocities that we, ex we get from our observations are actually different from what is expected from theory. Uh, because we, ex we, we know that we have more, uh, the, the center of the galaxies are more dense uh, than as you go uh, at larger radii. So we expect the rotation velocities to actually decline uh, as we go further and further from the, from the center of the galaxy. But observations show us something different. I've given an example of what uh, uh, we expect the observation, the rotation velocity to, to actually be and what observations are able to give us from, my, from the figure on my top left. So what we want to understand here uh, when we look at this uh, kinematics of these galaxies is how is this galaxy, how is this galaxy behaving? Are we still getting what uh, we expect from theory or are we getting what uh, we mostly see in observations. And if we are getting what we see from observation, then how can we disentangle this rotation curve and understand uh, the mass distribution of galaxies? Uh, apart from uh, NGC 6822, uh, I also looked at uh, two other dwarf galaxies. Here, I'm just showing one. I, uh, I looked at also system A and B, uh, but I'm just showing the rotation curve of system A here. Uh, and one interesting thing, if you look at the rotation curve of system A from the CAT7 observation, uh, that is on my right, you see that the rotation curve looks like it's actually declining. And the question is, is this actually showing us, showing us what we expect from, uh, from the observation? However, for us to be able to, to, to be clear and answer this question, there are other more uh, studies that we have to carry out. Uh, but uh, during my PhD, I didn't have time to do that. Uh, so as I said earlier on the rotation velocity is the observed rotation velocity is very important because it allows us to actually understand the distribution of matter in galaxies. And, um, I also I also studies the, uh, I, I looked at the uh, the distribution of matter in uh, the dwarf galaxies that I looked at and to carry out this study I used uh, two models and the first one was the isothermal model uh, this is uh, the one that uh, the distribution uh, is ex the, we expect the distribution with the flat cores and it is widely used by observers and we have what we call the Navarro Frank and White. Uh, so this is the, the CAPS dark matter halo uh, from the end body simulations. Uh, so we, we decomposed the observed rotation curve, curve in different components. Uh, we decomposed it in the gas component, uh, the stars, uh, the halo, the dark matter halo, as well as the model. Uh, you can see from the colors, the different colors of the different decomposition are shown on the on the figures from on my left and on my right. Uh, so when I looked at this uh, um, distribution of matter, we found that uh, the isothermal model actually produces well the observed rotation curve as compared to the Navarro, uh, Navarro Frank and White. And uh, we also observed that uh, with the dwarf galaxies that I looked at, 
they, they all tend to be dark matter dominated at all radii. I should mention that this result was not something new. Uh, studies, previous studies have been able to show that uh, most dwarf irregular galaxies tend to be dark matter dominated at all radii, and they mostly follow the isothermal model as compared to the Navarro, Frank, and White. Uh, so when I finished my PhD, I was still interested in dwarf galaxies. And at that time, MEERKAT, which is a precursor telescope uh, of uh, SKA, was almost completing. And I thought, well, MEERKAT is going to be more sensitive than MEERKAT. It's going to have a combination of compact uh, baselines as well as high resolution. Uh, with CAT7, we only have the compact baselines, but with MEERKAT, we are going to have both. So why can't I just put up a project, a proposal for my postdoc for me to be able to follow up these dwarf galaxies using this powerful instrument uh, that is the CAT7? So as I said earlier on, the advantage of the CAT7 is that it has the compact baselines that allows us to detect large scale structures, high sensitivity and high resolution. And the bonus is that it is on the Southern hemisphere. So we can actually be able to explore the Southern sky uh, while, as I am working on in South Africa. Uh, so what is it that I wanted to do with the, with the meerkat? Uh, one thing I wanted to understand is to try and study the connection between star formation H1 gas and gas accretion, as well as H1 dynamics. For us to be able to understand these properties, we actually need very, very high resolution observations because we have to look for, if is, is there existence of gas accretion? We have to look for inflows, outflows, and that requires us to, be, to, to actually carry out detailed kinematics of high velocity resolution observations. Uh, so in 29, I started my postdoc in 2019, and uh, the Meerkat core that was uh, advertised in 2019 at that time actually was not in my favor. So in as much as we had the 64 antennas, uh, short baselines, as well as the compact baselines, the ve velocity resolution of this core was actually 44 kilometers per second. You cannot carry out kind of, you, you cannot carry out the H1 kinematics of dwarf galaxies with the velocity resolution of 44 kilometers per second. You are not going to resolve anything. So uh, I, I had to actually have a different alternative. I said, well, I cannot do dwarf galaxies at this point, but I can actually put up a proposal to try and understand something that requires us to detect faint H1 uh, because we are going to have very high sensitivity observation from this core. And uh, in 2019, I, I put up a call to actually be able to, to observe uh, a, a nearby galaxy group that is NGC 7232. And uh, interesting enough, I got the, the uh, my proposal was successful. And uh, the, the motivation of actually wanting to study this uh, galaxy group. I got it from the ASCAP uh, observation. So ASCAP is a SKA pathfinder in Australia, and they actually observed this galaxy group and they were able to detect uh, new H1 clouds. So on my left is the, is the H1 map of this, um, of this galaxy group as observed using the ASCAP. So all that you are seeing in yellow was uh, the new detection of ASCAP. So I thought if uh, ASCAP has uh, 12 antennas, as compared to Meerkat that has 64 antennas, we can actually be able to go much deeper and detect the presence of low column density gas if it exists. Because as you can see, there's a possibility of us linking between the, the clouds that are C2 and C1 to the galaxy triplet that, um, that you can see on the far top there. And uh, truthfully, when we look at the meerkat observation of this galaxy group, so that's the figure on my top left, uh, as compared to the ASCAP observations, that's the figure on my top right. 
you can clearly see that the deep meerkat observation actually gives us much more H, a much more faint column density H1 as compared to the ASCAP observation. So we have all this low column density H1 that links the galaxy triplet as well as the tail, the um, H1 clouds that uh, ASCAP was able to detect. Uh, so these results were very successful. I published this paper in 2021. Uh, so we're going back to what am I currently doing now? Uh, I'm still interested in uh, looking at dwarf galaxies with meerkat. And uh, when we look at the meerkat telescopes, there are a lot of uh, proposals that they call for proposals. Uh, there is one that is currently ongoing. So for those that are interested in uh, actually putting up proposals with meerkat, you should check it out. There is uh, a call that is, um, uh, the deadline is uh, 3rd May. But how, from those calls that come, we also have what we call meerkat legacy survey. So these are different surveys that have just been given time on meerkat. And one of those survey is what we call the Mungos. So the Mungo survey actually aims at detecting 30 nearby disk and dwarf galaxies at a very, very, very high sensitivity. Each galaxy will be detected, will be observed for about 55 hours. Uh, when you look at these 30, dwarf, 30 galaxies, six of them are actually dwarf galaxies. So I thought, well, because this is a legacy survey, it already has time on Meerkat. Instead of me putting up my proposal, I can actually um, write a proposal to Mongols and ask them if I can actually be able to get observations from them and study these dwarf galaxies. So in December 2021, I managed to actually obtain two Mungo's dwarf galaxies. Uh, these galaxies were observed for 10 hours uh, per source, and they have a velocity resolution of five kilometers per second, which is good enough for me to be able to study the kinematics, the distribution of dwarf galaxies. Uh, so basically, these are just the two, I'm just showing uh, the images of the two dwarf galaxies that I'm currently looking at. I've, I just started working on, on these observations. And uh, so on, uh, on top, we have uh, J1337, and I have also have J1106. Uh, so I just want, uh, want, and I have multi-wavelength data on these observations. So I'm just putting up everything together. And uh, the main aim of this uh, study is, as I said earlier on, I want to study the connection between star formation H1 gas, gas accretion, and H1 dynamics. Uh, so just to summarize my presentation, uh, dwarf galaxies are the most abundant uh, objects in the universe, and uh, they are actually important in uh, helping us understand uh, uh, galaxy formation and evolution. Of, of evolution. Uh, neutral hydrogen provides a, provides a new window to the understanding of properties of galaxies. Uh, when we look at uh, extended H1, uh, we can actually be able to understand the environmental effects as well as uh, the extended kinematics can be able to give us an overview of the total uh, mass of the, of, of the galaxies. We have had, because CAT7 is, not, is currently not operation, so we have had a telescope that is the SKA Pathfinders such as CAT7 that are ideal for studying dwarf galaxies because they have compact baselines. And this instrument has been able to give us uh, a, a new information on uh, actually dwarf galaxies. Uh, currently we have Meerkat. The advantage of Meerkat is that it has a high sensitivity, high resolution. Uh, I, I, I forgot to also mention that it has a large field of view, um, which actually allows us to obtain a new window to how we are going to understand uh, these uh, uh, different uh, parameters or, or, or on galaxies so as we try to understand the uh, galaxy formation and evolution. And last but not the least is uh, more ex is expected with the SKA. The S S SKA is uh, projected to be to be in uh, working in in a few years to come. And this instrument is going to allow us uh, to observe the universe in unprecedented details. And uh, it's going to be to to bring a new um, a new window on how we understand galaxy formation and evolution in astrophysics. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brenda. Very good. 
if there are questions, please uh, raise your hands or uh, and then we are mute you. I have uh, one question for you and uh, looking at your result for each one for dwarf galaxies, also the last two that you showed. Uh, I see that uh, in general, each one uh, is in is some kind of structure that resembles a disk, a rotating disk. Also, if the galaxy is not exactly a disk galaxy, looking at the very dwarf one, the two last that you have shown are very touchy and so. Is this true or not? Uh, yes. so, you have, okay. It seems that you have some disks, but the galaxy is really very faint and diffuse. Oh yeah, so the, 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 uh, the, the purpose of this uh, deep observation is actually these uh, diffuse extended features, uh, because if we understand their kinematics, are they depicting gas that is in falling or outfalling? Why do, so these are going to help us to understand uh, if there's any inflows, uh, gas accretion that will be able to, uh, to help us understand why we still have more gas, even if there's star formation going on. Yeah. OK. Yes. And now there is Cecilia Bacchini. Go on, Cecilia. You are uh, on. Yes, you can. OK. <laughs> and the beautiful uh, data, by the way. Uh, I, was, uh, I have a curiosity. Um, so as you probably know, uh, we expect that uh, dwarf galaxies, I mean, the disk, the dwarf galaxies, is uh, significantly thick. So do you, do you see in the, um, in the data, in the channels, uh, indications of uh, this uh, thickness, uh, and more importantly, the fact that the thickness uh, should increase with the distance from the galaxy center, I mean, the, the so-called flaring, of gas disk, do you see these kind of features uh, in the in the in the data? Uh, so that's a very good question because uh, that is something that we want to experiment on this new data that we have. Uh, because previously it wasn't, uh, we were not able to do it with uh, two dimension uh, kinematical analysis that we have, such as Rodka. But now we have these three D kinematical analysis, such as uh, terrific that allows us to also be able to study the disk thickness. Uh, so this is something that I will try and do on these uh, new galaxies that I have obtained from Mercury. Yeah. Okay, so terrific can, uh, can uh, fit uh, the, the thickness. Yes, yes, yes. I Actually, my, my boss is uh, Josh, is the one who, ha who developed terrific. So this is the discussion that we have had. And we want to actually be able to do that on these, these two galaxies. OK, very interesting. Thank you very much. Yeah. Other question? Until we wait, we, we ask to you if uh, you can say to us why you decided to study astronomy. <laughs> okay, so when I was doing my, when I was um, in Zambia, my undergraduate, I did a Bachelor of Science in uh, Physics. Uh, at that time, I, I knew very little when it comes to astronomy because we don't have that background back home. So in, uh, in my fourth year, I attended this uh, workshop. It was an international workshop held in Zambia. And there I met astronomers and space scientists for the first time. So I was very, when they were presenting, I became very curious with their presentation, how much we can learn about the universe. And from that on, I just said, I want to learn more about this. This is something that I think I want to do. <laughs> and uh, when I finished my undergraduate, I definitely uh, applied for my, my honors in astronomy and space science at, in South Africa. <laughs> good yeah. choice, good choice. <laughs> and uh, you are doing a very good work. So well done. Thank you. Any other question? If there are no questions, we thanks again, uh, Brenda, for your very interesting talk. 
and see you in a month for the next Laura Bassi. Thank you very much. Thank you to you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.